Tena Kutu Kutoa. Um, my name is Alexander Richter. I'm a professor and the Associate Dean Professional Programs at the Wellington School of Business and Government. And it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you all to today's seminar. The title is Sanctions, Supply Chains and Shortages, the Economic Impact of the War in Ukraine. And I want to hand over now to um, Professor Ellen Boyar, who is a professor at practice um, and the inaugural holder of the chair for Pacific Region Business. Um, he's um, perfect to be as uh, his role as a host today because he has also recently uh, published a paper on the weaponization of money. Um, could this be the first economic world war, which explores the impact of Russia's invasion of Ukraine? So over to you, Alan. Well, thank you, Alex. Kia ora. Welcome, everybody, to this webinar. It's exactly one month ago that Vladimir Putin ordered his troops to go into Ukraine. And most of us were surprised and shocked at what happened. And since then, Victoria University has been considering what it can do and ultimately to do what universities and academics can do, which is to analyze, to understand, to educate about this phenomenon. We recognize it's a very complex historical geopolitical situation. We recognize there's some terrible humanitarian costs going on at the time. We want to throw light on one particular aspect, that is the economic implications. So to do that, we've got together a great panel for you. And I would like to introduce Olga Speranskaya. She's an economist. She's a business growth expert. She's been involved in startups and other issues in Wellington um, at the Wellington School of Business. And she's contributing to the Executive MBA Professional Development Program. We will then follow with El Dr. Eldred Kahia. He is Senior Lecturer in International Business at the Wellington School of Business and Government. We will go on to Grant Spencer, who's Teaching Fellow in the Financial Economics at the Wellington School of Business and Government, and has been had a long career in banking and central banking in New Zealand and elsewhere, and has been acting governor of the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. And then fourthly to Veronica Kashavili, uh, who is a program and project management professional consultant who worked in Wellington for a long time. She's recently completed her executive MBA at the Wellington School of Business and Government as well. We're going to get some different perspectives from all of those. Um, we are going to really look for the effects of three particular things, the Russian invasion on Ukraine, the international sanctions on Russia, and the overall effects on the world. So with the invasion, uh, we've seen disruption to a not insignificant primary producing economy, Ukraine, which is a big producer by world standards of wheat and barley and sunflower and corn and actually urea for fertilizer. And right at this moment, there's wheat, there's winter and spring cereal production going on or not going on, depending on its disruption and whether or not those harvests come through will be still to be seen. It's also a significant exporter of coal and steel and oil and gas and other engineering items in addition. Then we've got the Russian sanctions and we um, know that they are already led to sanctioning of oil and gas exports into many countries, not to the EU as yet, sanctioning of agricultural exports, sanctioning of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, um, sanctioning of technology and military imports into Russia, the end of a lot of inward foreign direct investment into Russia, sanctioning of a number of banks, um, and uh, in addition, effectively, the central bank as well, um, cutting off for many of them access to the SWIFT financial messaging scheme, as freezing assets, um, sanctioning state-owned enterprises, 
A number of Western companies have withdrawn from activities in Russia. The oligarchs have been focused on with regard to their property, their financial assets, their planes, their super yachts. Uh, Russia has faced sanctions before. In fact, in 2014, with the invasion of Crimea, there were a number of economic sanctions put in place. But this is big. It's much bigger. Actually, it's the biggest ever economic sanctioning since, well, outside war ever in the world. The um, experts on this, the Global Sanctions Database, record a large number of economic sanctions since World War II, and they have researched them and say that most of them cause significant economic damage. Do they actually achieve what they want to achieve? Do they contribute to their objectives? They say about half the cases they looked at have contributed to some extent to their objectives. But they also point out there are human rights costs and there are humanitarian costs from sanctions as well. It's not a simple feature. And then we're also interested in not just what the economic impacts on Russia are, but also the economic impacts on the rest of the world and economic impacts on sanction busting third countries as well. So it's a complex and big picture. And as we go in and look at the economic and try and unpin the economic implications of what's going on, let's turn first of all to Olga Speranskaya. Olga, can we hand over to you, thanks, to give us some context and some background on these economies. Thanks, Alan. Uh, kia ora, everyone. And uh, I'm obviously a Russian. And the first thing I need to say is I'm sorry. I think a lot of Russians that are um, in the same boat as me, feeling the same way, uh, would say the same thing in a, in a forum like this. Uh, the last four weeks have been very, very difficult, emotional, and you know, feeling the guilt. Uh, and probably the strongest feeling is being useless. And so I think a forum like this, I've been looking really looking forward to this conversation because you just never know how uh, contributing to an understanding could actually empower somebody somewhere to make a decision that will ultimately bring an end to the invasion and make everything, uh, if not back to what it was before, um, make everything better. I have uh, a few points to make, but I'll start with some context. As Alan said, this is kind of what I do and the, the hat I wear um, when I walk about my um, daily um, daily things in, in New Zealand and in Wellington. Uh, I do have a lot of history, even though I spent the last nearly 20 years in, in New Zealand. Uh, my connections are still very, very strong, both in Ukraine and Russia. Um, I won't go as far as Ivan the Terrible, <laughs> which is very tempting because some of the problems economic in the economic system have started there. But I'll go as far as 1992. And a, as a wee story, um, I was at university then in Moscow. And one of the exciting things that I was doing, having a little bit of English, um, I was employed as a translator quite a bit. And uh, I was working at the, uh, the first expo, which is, was called USA 1992. Um, which brought leaders of major American corporations and leaders of Russian businesses, a, a lot of them still state owned, and there were Ukrainian businesses at the expo. It was really, really exciting. And um, a lot of deals were negotiated, maybe not signed, but this was the start of something that would um, include Russia in uh, the global economy a lot better than it was before. It was the first year after independence for a lot of the um, former Soviet states. Um, there was certainly an air of hope and opportunity around all of that. Things continued on a reasonably um, good, good um, in reasonably good vein uh, throughout the 90s and by the mid 90s, incomes have started rising and startups starting uh, appearing everywhere like mushrooms. Uh, we even had 2000 banks registered at one stage. So this was vibrant. Uh, this was entrepreneurial and certainly the system changes were supporting that. Um, it wasn't a perfect system because uh, this was led by a lot of oligarchs and the um, some of the parameters were um, certainly skewed by virtue of having to change the different speed, uh, system in, at speed. Um, but people understood at that stage that these were largely growing pains and the hope was that would grow out of that and um, end up with a system that was conducive with being a, um, an advanced technologically and economically advanced country integrated into um, a Western style system. 
by the end of 90s, however, um, different sort of power structures started uh, playing and 1999, when the intelligence and military uh, came to power led by uh, Vladimir Putin, things started going downhill at an accelerated pace. So that um, important context uh, led to some system features that I want to emphasize today, because I think that they are important in understanding the impact of the war itself and, and the sanctions and the reactions um, on, on the world. The first um, system feature is a broken economic system that was supposed to su support entrepreneurship, but actually in reality didn't. Um, examples of that would be um, freedoms and ability to do business transparently. Uh, obviously, deep, deep seated corruption. And uh, probably the worst example of that uh, was that at some point during the early 2000s, businesses that were successful um, grew large, uh, were largely driven by entrepreneurial people that were starting something interesting, made a bit of money. These businesses started being approached um, by intelligence agencies and the military and started being taken over. So um, in that environment, you can't really start businesses. And a lot of people that were capable of doing that went overseas. So that's, that's um, broken, that broken system is, is there now and it's impacting everything. Second feature is too much global integration. I'm saying too much because too much relative to how Russia wants to position itself and how it wants to, um, to be in, in the global economic system. I think if this war was predicted and calculated, maybe economic integration um, into supply chains and um, inviting foreign direct investment wouldn't have been so enthusiastically supported in the early days. Um, but we'll talk about this later. There's some pretty major implications at the moment from, um, from the sanctions that stem from uh, the Russian economy being super integrated into supply chains and dependent in some, in some instances. And the third feature that we all know very, very well is a resource curse. We haven't learned from examples of other countries uh, who maybe um, acted a little bit smarter. So we took the money, um, it settled in, in the pockets of the few to the point that we're now seeing uh, you know, gold-plated toilet rolls and super yachts. Um, this has become a, um, a, a real curse that uh, limited the development of new technology where the incentives weren't there to invest in perhaps diversifying the sectors, um, limiting the country's development to, uh, to a resource base, um, and basically everything uh, stems, stems a little bit from there. Um, one of the bigger aspects of that lack of investment was uh, the lack of import substitution and creating local products that could, uh, that could um, become internationally competitive. A small sort of word on Ukraine. I followed Ukraine super, superficially, I guess, over the years. I knew that they were growing in independence and um, that word I'd probably use is modernizing, but with some problems. We know that it hadn't been very successful in stemming corruption within the business and the political system, but um, directionally they were going in, in a reasonably sort of Western and successful, successful way. Um, and of course, everything changed on February 24th um, with, with the invasion. I'll talk about impacts on Ukraine first. I think. Uh, the main uh, the main impact is, is as we all see uh, on television is demolition, is physical destruction. So the absence of infrastructure, uh, places to live, displacement of potential workers and leaders of business and uh, anyone basically who can hold a gun, being in the army at the moment and massive massive disruptions in supply chains. Um, impact wise, from you know even months or years into, into the future, uh, my main recommendation, my main um, statement that I'll make is that Ukraine will be okay. As it emerges out of the war, one way or another, none of us know how it will end and how long it will take, it sounds like, or it looks like it might take a while, um, but it will emerge out of the war as a free country and everyone will rush to help Ukraine rebuild. There are some financial considerations there, um, but we need not forget reparations and um, quite significant money that's frozen. 
in um, overseas accounts uh, and that Russia has no access to at the moment. But um, my feeling on, on Ukraine is that uh, there will be a lot of goodwill that will be accepted with open arms everywhere and that their people that are currently displaced will come back and help the country rebuild. So I've got no major concerns for Ukraine um, other than you know very significant humanitarian concerns right now. Um, Russia, on the other hand, at the moment is a raging bull that seems to be charging um, at everyone and everything in the hope uh, that it will make it feel better because it wasn't feeling great even um, before the invasion. I think it's fair to say um, that the leaders that started the war definitely miscalculated the price that it was going to bring. And I think the unification of both Ukraine and the defense and the rest of the world and uh, condemning the invasion uh, and the sanctions that followed it definitely wasn't calculated then. Um, I do uh, want to say that, you know, sanctions play a major role, but I think uh, for me, the impacts I'm seeing right now, sanctions are probably slower moving and slower acting. The impacts that are a lot more significant, a lot more felt and a lot more visible to the people on the ground, the, um, the ones that are living or uh, have stayed in Russia, there's been a lot of, a lot of exits, is, is foreign companies and foreign direct investment leaving, um, leaving the shores of Russia. Um, I recommend following the um, University of Yale um, who have compiled and are continuing to compile a real-time database and compilation of companies. They're in different categories. Some have left outright, some have continued some operations. Um, so case in point is uh, PepsiCo. They left their drinks division is out of Russia, but they've left their potato chips um, growing, harvesting and packaging on the grounds that it's an essential good. Um, so there are some examples of quite mixed sort of reactions uh, from foreign businesses. And there's a reasonable number of them that actually have stayed. And I've got um, personally question marks of uh, some Japanese and French interests that are leaving and some that are staying. I'm not quite sure how that is going to play out and what impact China and India will have on acting as a compensatory partner for Russia in the goods that cannot be got any other way, but um, probably fair to say that the rest of the world is leaving Russia alone. Um, I'll use two words to describe um, impacts on Russia. One is volatility, unprecedented extreme volatility in everything, pricing, um, product availability, supply chain. Nobody really knows where to go. Um, and the system, the economic system, uh, common word I'm hearing or phrase I'm hearing is that the economic system does not exist and might exist in the future, but it's actually self-destructed and isolation. So uh, the doom has um, sort of already uh, become a reality in some degrees. There's some very pragmatic things that um, people are looking at, for example, you know, down to earth. So female hygiene uh, products are not available at all. So they have gone out the window. Um, printing paper, so basic functions, uh, for example, medical institutions have been forbidden to print anything, even um, prescriptions, because the only paper that Russia can produce without the whitening agent that's made in Finland, 100% of it, is yellow paper that's more resembling sandpaper. So um, there are huge concerns about availability of some pretty um, basic and fundamental things. Um, my humanitarian concern uh, is for the people that are left in Russia and that will live through that is threefold. One is pharmaceuticals. Uh, there's definitely a huge number of them that are internationally made once they run out and they've got an expiry date. So that will be a year and a half to two years from now, that will be a major, major issue. Um, transport, anything that carries people. Uh, fast forward two years, I'll be scared to go on public transport or fly anywhere or take, take, take a train. And third one is energy infrastructure like power turbines. Russia has undertaken a significant modernization program and a lot of these, um, this equipment is made in Italy and other places and there's no way to maintain that. So uh, these things will start failing. Um, so, and, and in terms of, you know, other impacts, I think uh, we're lucky it's summer for everyone's sake at the moment. Um, and my prediction for Russia, and I say this with a big heartache, is that Russia won't matter to, as a trading partner very soon and maybe forever. 
um, won't say, say that lightly, but I think that's um, kind of the impact I'm seeing um, and the, the natural outcome of events right now. Um, I don't want to leave you on a um, sort of gloomy note like this. Russians are very um, known for um, joking even in the darkest circumstances. There's a, a go and joke, there's many, um, but the one that's kind of more economic uh, in nature is the one uh, you should keep your savings in a pile of rubles. No burglar in their sane mind would uh, look there. Thank you, Nkirkaha, Ukraine. Thank you, Olga, and thank you for your insight and also your courage in, in doing it. And we, we feel for you and that, your position on that. Um, we'll come back to Olga, um, and it's a chance for participants, if they've got any questions they'd like to pose to the panel, to put them into the chat function. Uh, they're only going to be seen by the panel and the organisers, not by other participants. We'll be curating them here and putting some of those questions to the panel. Thank you, Olga. We're now going to go to Eldred and hear his views on impacts on trade, supply chains, and all the things that hang off that. So thank you, Eldred. Thank you, Alan. Uh, Kiora. Um, so the things that I want to talk about uh, briefly here, some of them have already started coming up um, from Olga's presentation and also from uh, the initial briefing that uh, Alan gave at the start. So if you think of uh, Russia and you think of Ukraine, you are thinking primarily of two things in terms of their impact on the world, food and fuel. And we are going to get a, almost a double whammy of, uh, of disruptions in that regard. Um, one, one area of disruption is the actual production of these, of, uh, of these fundamentals in these two countries. And then you are, we're also going to have to deal with the supply chain related concerns that are arising from, from, from that. So Europe gets 40% of its, uh, of its uh, gas out from, uh, from, from Russia. And that dependence is still quite, quite strong. And um, we've seen already with, uh, with the disruptions, the extent to which prices are rising. So I think uh, the price of a barrel of oil has gone back to its, to its highest since uh, 2014. And uh, I think the price of uh, low sulfur, low sulfur fuel that's used in uh, shipping vessels has actually doubled uh, to about $1,000 a ton, a metric ton. That's twice as much as the price uh, prior to the pandemic. So these are things that we're actually going to, 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 to have to deal with. And a lot of the large uh, shipping companies, they are looking at this and saying, oh, this is additional cost. This is additional risk to us. So the risk of insuring uh, vessels, um, you know, especially the ones that are going in and around the Black Sea at the moment, that cost has gone from about one to about 5% of the ship's, uh, ship's value. So these are real costs, not notional or imagined costs, real costs that we're going to have to, uh, to grapple with. So the impact on fuel, the impact on food, which is another aspect that Alan mentioned at the very start. Uh, so corn, wheat, uh, barley, sunflower seeds. Uh, both countries are big, uh, very big players in this regard. Russia, a huge player, and Ukraine as well. And a lot of this product um, is actually destined for, for sub-Saharan Africa in, 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 in a lot of cases. I think sub-Saharan Africa imports as much as eight to nine billion from Ukraine and Russia combined of cereals, of seed, of wheat, of barley, of corn. Uh, and these are going, this is going to be quite problematic if this product cannot be produced or be moved uh, very quickly to, 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 uh, to, the, to the areas in which it is needed. So that's just the, the production side. The shipping side, I think, is even uh, sort of more worrisome if we start to look at the specifics of what's been happening there. Uh, significant disruptions to, to supply chains at the moment. I think Olga touched on this initially, uh, mentioning that you know, the, the integration is itself, is Russia too integrated into the world economy? I think this is where we are starting to see some evidence of that. So if we look at sea freight, I will go over all modes of transport here, but I'll just talk about sea freight and the air cargo very quickly. Uh, if we look at sea freight for a start, so the, the three of the largest shipping companies in the world, um, Maersk, uh, 
uh, I think out of Denmark, um, Mediterranean Shipping Company out of Switzerland, and CMA, CGM out of, uh, out of France. All three have said, you know what, we are not taking new shipments into or out of Russia, so no new bookings that we are taking until such a time that we know of, uh, you know, how what the future is going to look like. Uh, the large, um, you know, courier companies, the DHLs, FedExes, they've taken a similar, a similar stance as well. Uh, and we have several ports in Europe, and in particular in the UK, that are not allowing ships uh, from Russia uh, to dock or ships carrying uh, Russian goods to dock. Then the flip side of this, we also have uh, vessels that are going to Russia or going to parts of this region that are now facing multiple rounds of physical inspections. And all of this creates delays and uh, creates additional costs. So I think as we speak, there's close to 100 ships and their crew that are stranded in ports in Ukraine. Uh, and all of these things are presenting um, quite, a, quite a significant challenge. If we look at air cargo, so from the sanctions alone, right? So Russian airspace is off limits. And uh, the flip side to that, you know, the US, EU, Canada, among other countries have also banned Russian aircraft from uh, using their own uh, airspace. Now, what, is this, what this does now is it squeezes an, an already very, very tight or difficult global air cargo capacity. So for example, for instance, flights that are coming from Europe and going to, into Asia are being rerouted. And uh, the cost of rerouting that is quite, is quite significant. Uh, a typical flight, a London to Tokyo flight, uh, because of the rerouting, uh, now takes an additional two and a half hours uh, to complete. Now, if you ask, if we, if, we, if we follow along with some of the modeling that flight radar has done on this, uh, a Boeing 777 uh, that's flying London to Tokyo with that additional two and a half hours from the rerouting will require an additional 5,500 gallons of fuel. That's a 20% increase on the carrier, whether that's, you know, a FedEx, a UPS, a DHL, and in New Zealand, that means you know, a significant additional cost. And that, uh, that 5,500 gallons of fuel translates to about 60 tons of additional CO2. Now, if you multiply this by the four to 500 flights that are being diverted or rerouted every month, you start to see how uh, difficult and how challenging all of these circumstances are. And this, all of these additional costs are going to have to be passed on to some end user, a traveler, uh, you know, an importer, an exporter. So eventually all of these things uh, will have to, you know, somebody will actually have to, to pay the cost of that. So these are very, very challenging uh, aspects at the moment, especially given that uh, in 2022, at least at the start, there was a bit of momentum in sort of the global logistics industry that, hey, we are turning the corner. The worst of COVID has come and gone. But I think um, what we are seeing now uh, develop as a result of the sanctions and the disruption is uh, something that will set back the industry for a few, a few months, if not another year or two. Now, impacts to, uh, to New Zealand. I think New Zealand, uh, so far, we've been uh, fairly lucky, fairly insulated. And by impact here, I'm just confining some of my sentiments or my points to the impact on our tradable sector, our importers and our exporters. I think a lot of the impact so far is mostly indirect, right? We'll have to deal with the impact of our energy costs and fuel prices uh, just as a country uh, as the situation develops. But if we are looking specifically at imports and exports, uh, New Zealand is not particularly exposed to Russia uh, in that regard. I think exports to about 270 million a year, imports of about 150 million a year. So that is not very, very significant. If we draw this down a little bit and maybe go to the sort of situation with Fonterra, you'll also see that um, you know, it's been relatively easy for Fonterra to say, okay, initially we are going to stop our exports to Russia. Uh, I think that was mostly bad as well. And then for them to eventually, I think last week to say, oh, actually, we are calling off you know, the international joint venture and we are just going to you know, um, share off our Russian operations. I think for Fonterra, that's just 1% of their exports, which they, they will be uh, very, they will be able to reallocate uh, in their other uh, export markets very easily. 
So I think for now, this is where I'll leave some, some, some of my points. Um, we'll return to, I think, hopefully some of these in, uh, in the Q&A. Well, thank you, Eldred. That's very interesting and some very practical things that you're talking about in terms of trade disruption. Now, what about finance? What about investment? What about capital flows? And all the lifeblood of an economy that's running through those financial markets. Can we turn to Grant Spencer? So, Grant, thank you. Uh, thanks, Alan, and kia ora, everyone. So I'll look at the impact of the sanctions from a markets perspective and a macroeconomic perspective. Um, <clears throat> And in terms of the impact of these sanctions onto the global economy going in that direction, the main transmission we're really talking about here is this huge increase in commodity prices, uh, the doubling of oil and gas prices, big increases in, in cereals and the range of metals. This is effectively an adverse supply shock, uh, which is going to impact the global economy from the point of view of pushing up inflation, uh, pushing up interest rates and weakening overall economic activity. And so this is how the markets were perceiving it. So stock markets uh, tended to weaken. Uh, there was a move to safe haven assets such as gold and the US dollar. Um, <clears throat> and you know, the overall effect, um, there's not many estimates as yet, but OECD has estimated that <clears throat> world GDP may weaken by about 1% this year and inflation may increase 2.5% uh, over and above what would otherwise have been the case. Now, in Russia, of course, um, it's a much more dramatic effect, as, as people have been saying. Um, the ruble dropped uh, 40%. There was a run on cash uh, from the banks, panic buying of food and imported goods. Uh, the stock market crashed and was tra trading was suspended. And the Central Bank of Russia came in and tried to sort of uh, prop up uh, the, the ruble and moderate the impact on the domestic banking system. They increased interest rates, more than doubled them from 8.5% to 20%. Um, they uh, supported the banks with liquidity and put in place uh, uh, foreign exchange controls to try and conserve uh, foreign exchange resources um, in the economy. So the central bank was trying to sort of soften it and effectively softening the financial, the blow to the financial system um, or in Russia. But there's not much doubt that there will be a, a real significant hit on the Russian economy uh, in terms of um, a recession. And estimates I've seen put that at maybe 10 to 15% uh, weaker GDP this year and potentially inflation up to 25% by the end of the year <clears throat> with persistent shortages and bottlenecks um, <clears throat> that, that we've heard about. So there's no doubt there'll be a significant uh, economic hit. I think there's a, a big question though about you know, how long this is going to last. Like Eldred mentioned, you know, just um, dis tra transport disruptions um, from maybe a few months or maybe one to two years it's in terms of picking that time horizon, uh, I think is quite difficult. Um, on the financial side, uh, it's um, an important to recognize that Russia is actually more resilient uh, now than it was in previous crises, say in, either in 1998 or in the GFC. Um, its government accounts have been in a pretty strong position. There's a low level of public debt. It's been running a current account surplus and has a net positive external financial position. 
So you'd have to say that Russia is actually less reliant on the international funding and financial markets than it has been in previous uh, difficult times. So, <clears throat> um, and, and, and it, it, you'd have to say that actually the Russian government finances could even be strengthened given the oil price is doubling. And so as long as the uh, Europeans continue to buy oil from, uh, and gas from Russia, um, you know, it's going to give the uh, Russian authorities the wherewithal financially to um, buffer the, the country from this big shock. Commenting just uh, on a couple of the um, financial sanctions, um, following the clampdown of the, on the big Russian banks and the freezing of foreign exchange assets, um, it was expected in the international markets that the, the Russians might default on their foreign currency debt, and that debt was downgraded from investment grade to junk. Um, but so far, the um, Russians have actually met the debt service payments, and it does seem that the, the Russia is intent on avoiding default. But you know, even if the West sort of forced put the pressure on for, to force a default, um, <clears throat> you'd have to say that given the relatively low level of foreign debt, the reliance on the international markets, that may not be um, you know a huge impost on the uh, Russian economy if they if they were indeed forced to default. Um, just on the on the payment side of things, the other main uh, sanction we, we saw was, um, as Alan mentioned, the exclusion uh, of eight large Russian banks from the SWIFT um, international uh, messaging system for, for interbank payments. And this clearly will damage um, those uh, banking institutions, but I think you have to question um, whether this, uh, the impact that this will have on Russia's ability to make payments for goods and services and capital transactions going forward. And that's because firstly, the West have left significant exemptions for energy and debt payments. And secondly, uh, payments will, I think, be increasingly diverted through smaller Russian banks who remain in the SWIFT system and through Chinese and Indian banks, uh, many of whom seem uh, quite keen to pick up that business. So <clears throat> it's very hard to apply real, effectively uh, sustainable um, sanctions through the payment system, given the ability of money to get through the cracks. So um, overall, I would say clearly Russia, the Russian economy is going to take a serious hit this year with the slump in activity, high inflation and the significant you know, shortages in many areas. However, <clears throat> financially, uh, Russia will remain in a relatively strong position to absorb the shock, provided uh, Europe continues to uh, buy uh, oil and gas uh, from Russia. And furthermore, I would expect the impact of the, san the sanctions will be eroded through time as both trade and payments increasingly get diverted through uh, third markets and in particular through China. Thanks, Alan. Oh, thank you, Grant. That's a pretty interesting perspective on that that we're going to come back to soon as well. So now my pleasure to hand over to Veronica Kashavili. And Veronica has been living in New Zealand for some years. She's a New Zealander, but she comes originally from Georgia and has family in Georgia. And of course, Georgia has experience with Russia. Veronica, thank you. 
Thank you, Alan. Um, well, I've been thinking about the, I guess, the view that I should take on the current situation, considering that we are talking about macroeconomic uh, influences as a result of Russia's invasion into Ukraine. And I thought that perhaps the unique perspective that I could bring uh, to the conversation is um, maybe from a perspective of a country that is a neighboring country that was part of the Soviet Union and has experienced uh, some of the similar, I guess, um, aggression of the foreign um, Russian politics in the past, uh, you might be, well, I guess, um, aware of the in invasion in 2008 and the five-day war that Russia had experienced back then, uh, with Russia still occupying approximately 20% of Georgian territory. And of course, the focus of what I'd like to cover off is really the economic relationship between the countries and what um, the current situation might mean for the wider region, particularly neighboring areas. Uh, without going into the description of the economic sanctions, which have already been very well covered by um, other panelists, I guess the summary that I would like to bring to this conversation is that the current sanctions that Russia is experiencing, of course, um, affects um, the elites in Russia quite a bit. However, I guess the sentiment from the general population is that the withdrawal of the large internationals from the Russian market and perhaps disappearance of some of the products may not be of quite so much impact on the general population. Um, people are expecting the effects that could be similar to the potential complete economic devastation that happened in the post-Soviet collapse period in 91. But perhaps on the other hand, because uh, people have experienced it in 91, then in 98, um, the uh, threat of further economic, I guess, uh, sanctions and difficulties is not having quite such a big effect on the general population that probably feels that they can weather the storm, if you like. Now, the reason obviously we've, we've been having uh, difficulties and the economic collapse did occur in the period, in the post-Soviet Union collapse period, is because of the supply chains and how they were structured originally as part of the wider Soviet Union, where many of the countries were basically disconnected from the overarching supply chain and were unable to carry on producing their products being heavily dependent on other states and Russia very much in particular. And ever since the uh, Soviet Union collapse, Russia remained the key trade partner for many of the surrounding countries. And throughout the recent history, despite the potential geopolitical conflicts that may have been in place, Ultimately speaking, the sanctions on Russia, therefore, could potentially affect the neighboring countries who are still currently reliant on trade with Russia and may or may not be on the list of the unfriendly countries um, at the moment. Uh, for instance, many of the businesses, and if I was to speak for Georgia, for example, a lot of the export from Georgia is still predominantly into Russia with some export into um, European Union and other places. And um, many of the families are actually directly relying on the uh, revenue that would be sent by their family members that are located in Russia or living in Russia or working in Russia and would be sending money back to support them. So the sanctions on Russia could potentially have the wider effect on the surrounding countries and the neighboring countries, regardless of how good or bad the um, political environment is and the relationship is between the two. I guess as a result of the sanctions as well and the evolving situation, what, what I'd like to point out as well is the new emerging the migration pattern that um, has um, developed over the last month. Um, obviously, we see um, a massive migration out of Ukraine um, as refugees into EU and other countries that are welcoming those people. And we know that New Zealand will be welcoming up to 4,000 uh, individuals of people who are related to the Ukrainians who are already living in New Zealand. But the interesting um, observation I'd like to, I guess, point out is that since the restrictions on free speech that have been recently imposed in Russia, many of the Russians are looking for a way to move out of Russia to uh, different countries. And specifically, Georgia has been experiencing um, tens of thousands of Russian migrants um, 
leaving Russia and moving to Georgia temporarily or just waiting out either the economic sanctions or just observing how the environment is going to evolve. And I must say of those individuals, many of them are highly skilled. Uh, there are many IT professionals and many uh, specialists in other areas, which sort of in itself is offering um, to some degree, perhaps an opportunity for the neighboring um, nations as well to um, acquire the skilled labor that perhaps they may have a shortage in or uh, generally require for further economic development. That could potentially be um, something that could be useful for New Zealand as well, considering our own labor shortages here and um, the need to bring in the skilled labor, particularly in say ICT, medical profession and so on and so forth. Now, um, going back to the economic dependence and influence over the uh, neighboring countries, um, from Russia, obviously that invites political pressure and influence as well, which uh, has been evident in many of the countries of the region. And again, I can specifically refer to Georgia. Uh, learning from this experience, um, I guess the uh, next steps for the neighboring countries that are dependent on trade with Russia will be looking for further independence, economic independence and independence in trade, perhaps not putting all their eggs in the single basket and uh, varying their uh, trade, um, trade routes and trade agreements with others. Um, this strongly links to the energy supply restrictions to unfriendly countries that uh, we have been experiencing recently and the price inflation stemming from the sanctions imposed on Russia. This could become an additional catalyst, I guess, in speeding up the uptake of uh, perhaps sustainable energy generation in the longer term. However, in the immediate future, this could continue contribute, um, contributing towards the price inflation. Um, with regards to the points of uh, heightened importance in independence and energy sources, I'd like to actually draw your attention to the existing pipelines um, that are part of the Southern Gas Corridor and as well as the uh, oil pipelines. So, you would be aware that there is a uh, Bakut Belisi Sehan oil pipeline that uh, carries oil basically from Azerbaijan all the way to Sehan in, um, in uh, Turkey. And in parallel to that pipeline, there is a Bakut Belisi Erzurum gas pipeline, um, which are basically strategic projects um, diversifying energy supplies and are offering new opportunities um, to Europe to actually have access to gas and oil from non-Russian um, sources, if you like. From that perspective, it's um, quite interesting actually. Um, obviously the Bakut Belisi um, Erzurum gas pipeline, which is called um, Trans Anatolian, Trans Anatolian pipeline, uh, did connect to Trans Adriatic pipeline as well. So it carries gas through Greece onto Italy, but with the development of Trans -Ad Adriatic pipeline, there was actually a stop put onto a different pipeline that uh, referred to it as Nabucco, Nabucco pipeline, that was originally planned to carry gas from Azerbaijan via Turkey to all the way to um, Austria, actually to the border of Germany. So that project was originally stopped in 2013, but it is possible that considering the current circumstances and the further desire to actually uh, diversify the energy sources in, uh, in Europe, perhaps there is an opportunity to revisit the possibility of that project being reignited um, to uh, diversify the sources. Now, um, the current sanctions and the current um, evolving macroeconomic situation is likely uh, to, in my view, lead to uh, the desire to be more self-reliant uh, in energy production or um, in other areas. Uh, we have seen in post-COVID environment that has already been a move away to some extent from um, globalization sentiment so it is possible that anti-globalization sentiment um, is likely to be even more, more pronounced going forward as a result of this conflict and um, the impact on our economies. Um, um, we are seeing that there is 
possibly a move towards more regionalization of alliances, if you like, with proposal of uh, U24. There is uh, an alliance that is between China and Central Asian countries. So there is this tendency towards uh, creating the regional alliances a little bit more. So it would be an interesting area to observe and it might actually have significant implications for New Zealand. Um, I guess what this current situation is going to mean in the longer term and how the sanctions are going to un un unfold very much uh, relies on, um, on how this conflict will be addressed. And unfortunately, even though we're trying to stay uh, linked to uh, economic analysis, it's very hard to disconnect the economics from geopolitics these days. I guess for us to understand what the further implications will be and how long the sanctions are likely to last, we need to probably understand a bit of a nuance uh, behind the conflict and um, whether there is actually uh, a purely economic motivation behind the conflict or perhaps other motivations. Um, something that is often, I guess, um, undervalued, uh, particularly by those that are, are not linked to that region, is that most of the countries of the former Soviet Union are not homogenous with regards to the ethnic composition. Uh, yes, mo most countries will have an identifiable ethnic majority, but in reality, they are very, very multicultural. And the conflicts amongst ethnicities um, are not so much amongst ethnicities, the, the political conflicts and geopolitical conflicts are often actually disconnected from the culture and from ethnic composition. So um, when we are looking at the uh, current situation between in Russia invading Ukraine, um, the ethnic understanding and the ethnic appreciation of each of the nations goes way back before Soviet Union. We are talking hundreds of years back. So I guess a resolution of a conflict like that uh, can often be prolonged and whether there is going to be a long-term peaceful resolution as a result also depends on how um, the nations will be able to address this complexity. Um, there is a possibility that we currently have a bit of a misalignment between the economically motivated West, because a lot of the time uh, the actions of the Western countries are driven by macroeconomic motivations. And potentially at the moment less rational and what appears to be even um, deontological motivation uh, within Russia and perhaps even Ukraine right now. Um, as I said, the um, conflict is not purely about economics. There is a lot more that sits behind that conflict that could stand in the way of quick resolution. And it could be that de deontological motivation that could stand in the way of the current economic measures and sanctions actually playing a strong enough role to be an effective deterrent for a long-term return to peace. Um, I guess um, last thing that I would like to um, put to you and think about is whether um, considering the current circumstances, uh, it is still possible to continue viewing global and local economic development independently from geopolitics and whether this sort of thinking um, uh, can start inching towards perhaps a reductionist view of the situation. Um, and it, it's just a question that I guess I will uh, leave you with to think about. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Veronica. And that question is clearly there in everybody's minds. And it's actually the underpinning question that comes come through all the chat questions so far. They're about geopolitics. And we can't separate them out from the economic things that we're talking about. But uh, so far, we've heard um, Eldred saying there's some big trade blockage, shortage difficulties ahead. But Grant actually saying there's some financial resilience that's there as well that may not actually hurt Russia so much. Um, Olga's given us a whole lot of background on this. And Veronica, you've been talking about regional alliances. One of the questions that has come through is takes that question of regional alliances and says, well, if you look at it in a bigger 
world, are we heading into a new Cold War? Is there a risk that there could be a new set of alliances between West on one hand and Russia, China on the other hand, and the others either sitting on the fence or joining the camps in a sort of economic Cold War in the future? Uh, we've heard a bit about the prospects that China could have from either going around some of these sanctions or putting pressure on Russia or taking advantage of both sides on this. Any thoughts from our panel about the risk of a serious big schism that's got economic implications between the West and Russia, China, plus plus? Um, <clears throat> could I make a comment, Alan? Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, I think there's a there's a huge risk of, you know, <laughs> regional polarization, if you like. But I think the, the, the both the West and China, because the two big players are here in terms of China and the US, I'm sure they don't want uh, this this war, the Russia Ukraine situation to. Um, <clears throat> really cause um, a, a worsening or acceleration of the deglobalization. So I just think that both, both the US and China will tread very carefully and really work hard to try and ensure that there's not a, a, um, a sort of a truncation of trade between the major powers because, you know, the, the, the huge relationship the sort of symbiotic relationship between the US and China with uh, China's trade surplus and America's deficit with the, with the, fina with the fi money financing going in the other direction uh, with, um, <clears throat> you know, is sort of fundamental to where the, the global economy is at present. So my feeling is that, the, that they'll try and maintain uh, the, the international trade that that, uh, that huge trade link that currently exists between China and the West, but that a lot of the sanctions, if, if Chinese companies are seen or caught to be, you know, supporting Russia or breaching the sanctions with Russia, then they will be punished. But there'll be a lot of smoke and mirrors used and a lot of the frontline Western oriented Chinese companies won't get involved in those that uh, sanction busting. But there'll be all sorts of new companies and regional domestic companies in China that do in fact get involved in that uh, sanction busting. So I think there's gonna be a bit of, you know, a lot of positioning and things going on behind the scenes that will effectively erode uh, the sanctions behind the scenes. And of course, there's going to be some interesting commercial possibilities for China if they're prepared to sign up for cheap contracts for oil and gas, um, for cheap cereals production, um, if they're prepared to uh, fill some of the gaps that are going to be there for Russian imports, and if they're prepared to um, put money into the Russian economy and fill some of the gaps of the exiting Western uh, companies around as well. Olga, um, you've worked in a number of these places and you have been at one stage of your career promoting New Zealand trade into some of these areas. Have you got any thoughts about that bigger regional scene? Uh, yes, I do. It's pretty much uh, along the lines of what Grant has, has just uh, voiced, I think. There's definitely there's two uh, two major players. China's obviously bigger, but India's making some pretty significant moves as well to take some spaces, and uh, they will be invited and they will benefit from um, from from the shortages in Russia, and it will step into that space. But I feel like um, in in doing so, there will be a lot of care and caution applied to not upset some of the balances that exist with the other nations. And going back to the question of, you know, will there be a, a massive Cold War and will there be alliances that will be headbutting for um, months and years to come? I think, uh, no, there won't be. And it's one of those 
invasions and wars where there is one clear culprit. And I think um, the sentiment that I'm picking up is that, you know, Russia is, is sort of an outcast and other countries will be very careful touching that um, and being known for alliances. But that goes, you know, under uh, what happens under the surface of the water is obviously much more nuanced. There will be deals done and there will be, you know, humanitarian type. I think we won't get into hunger situation um, in Russia. I don't think that will ever be the case. Um, but there will certainly be opportunities um, of a, a major type, for example, all of, um, you know, foreign cars disappearing off the streets uh, of Russia, China makes some of those. So, of course, they will be invited to participate. And if they can do that safely for themselves in a political or sort of macroeconomic sense, I think they will. Um, but that doesn't mean that they will go into an alliance and there will be sort of a cold war with major economic implications. I think there's grief enough out there and all the major players are seeing volatility and they don't want to exacerbate that. That's kind of where I see this. Thanks. So, Eldred, um, you, you, we're talking about supply chain disruption and trade disruption at a time when actually there's a heap of disruption still going on as a result of COVID, as a result of Trump trade wars, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and you've got some interesting background yourself, originally from Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe has been under sanctions for since well, roughly year 2000. Um, any thoughts from what you've heard on the others on uh, whether or not the question of supply chain disruption, blockages, decoupling, could actually spread into an east-west or Russia-China versus Western economies sort of picture? I think, uh, th th thank you. Yeah, I do have, um, I guess, a, a background with that exposure to, um, you know, to, to a Zimbabwean economy that was undergoing sanctions. So I'm not, I, I'm not sure if my experience speaks directly to, you know, the decoupling, but it speaks to other elements around, you know, what sanctions do broadly to, to economies. So I think what, what, what I managed to, to sort of see, experience firsthand, in some cases vicariously with the situation in Zimbabwe, especially at the onset, you know, sort of 2000 to 2004, the two or three things that jumped up to me at that time was the fact that it's diff generally very difficult to target sanction, sanctions. You can say we've identified these individuals, we've identified these industries, we've identified these organizations, but the actual targeting of sanctions uh, for purposes of making a real impact is actually a lot more difficult than it looks um, in, in principle. And I think it takes us to a few points that all, both Olga and uh, Grant have, have, have touched on. Um, I think uh, Grant did a very interesting um, um, you know, um, creep on that, that, you know, money will always find its way through, through, through the cracks. Uh, the politically connected, uh, the elites will almost always find their way around systems and be able to circumvent that. So that's one side, the targeting of sanctions uh, and their intended impact on uh, certain individuals or organizations. There's another dimension to it, which is the impact of sanctions. So the impact is supposed to go squarely to those that are targeted. But in most cases, it doesn't. Um, every now and then we see that the impact can actually spread more broadly in the general population, it can actually affect you know, the ordinary man or woman uh, on the street. And then there's a, there are downstream effects of that. So, so right, if I, if, I, if I wrap this around, these two points together around nicely, first, the, this notion that elites can circumvent sanctions through very, you know, intricate and unscrupulous deals and uh, sort of mechanisms behind the scenes. And the fact that the common man or woman on the streets, on the street gets impacted. If you look at those two together, you start to see how um, um, parallel markets, black markets and all kinds of uh, informal marketing activity uh, starts to mushroom. So if I go back to Zimbabwe and I don't think Russia will necessarily end up in that situation. But if you go back to the Zimbabwe of 2004, um, uh, the economy was probably 75, 80% formal activity versus you know, 25, 30% informal. It's flipped the other way around now. And I think that's predominantly due to sanctions and their sort of wide ranging uh, effect and the fact that it's very, very 
difficult to have them, them targeted specifically. And Veronica, um, keeping with that question, uh, you talked about regional economic matters. And of course, um, again, it's complicated because the Soviet Union, well, the Russian empire under the Tsars was huge. The Soviet Union was big. Um, it was ruled for many years by a Georgian. And um, now since 89, a lot of that's broken down, but we're not sure how much it's broken down. And clearly in Putin's mind, the Ukrainian connection is broken down too much and needs to revert. Uh, I understand that in Russia, Russia has actually more migrants from, the, from outside Russia than almost any other country. So there's a lot of workers there from the region. And uh, we're interested what sort of regional effects there could be from these Russian sanctions. And is there still a sort of feeling, any sort of feeling of economic alliance around the region? The, what used to be Comic-Con, I suppose the nearest that there is to that now is um, the Eurasian Economic Union. And it's got Belarus and Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan and Armenia in it. Uh, do you see any comparison to the EU there? Do you think that's significant in the way people are thinking about the region, or is it purely a security and political sort of issue for him? Thank you for this uh, fantastic question. Um, just like any other matters, this is a very complicated aspect because, again, we have economic alliances and I think still quite a very a serious dependence on trading with Russia, Russia being, you know, the neighbor and there being a lot of history with Russia over centuries, we're talking about not just during the Soviet Union, but also previously, which does not necessarily align with agreement with the political structures and the political policies. And that's where I guess the dichotomy exists that from the economic perspective, it makes sense that the countries continue trading with each other. But when the Russian external politics starts to, I guess, affect the sovereignty of the neighboring nations, that's where the conflict starts rearing its head. So yes, there are countries of the former Soviet Union that are still very much in alignment with um, uh, Russia's political system, if you like, and the way they see their future evolving. I mean, Belarus is a very good example. I believe Kazakhstan and other Central uh, Asian countries are also quite in alignment there. So there isn't this, I guess, um, political misalignment to some extent. So the trade amongst those countries is likely to continue. The economic relationship is likely to continue being quite strong. It is much harder for smaller nations like Georgia. It's only three and a half million people, tiny little territory, geopolitically extremely important. But obviously, you cannot possibly compare the strength in any way of what Georgia could achieve alone and the neighboring countries and particularly um, Russia being north of Georgia. So in terms of the migration, yes, uh, many of the former Soviet Union, I guess, uh, representatives, and we're not talking about ethnicities here, we're talking about, um, I guess, the citizenships. Um, because ethnicities, again, um, we are talking about hundreds of different ethnic minorities that live on that territory. So people did choose to go to Russia because the employment opportunities were probably a little bit better there. Mind you, when the Soviet Union collapsed, Russia probably was the least affected economically country of all. Everybody else and um, countries like Georgia suffered immensely. And there was an absolute anarchy for decades after that. Um, so yes, the natural tendency was to continue trading with Russia, to uh, seek out the employment opportunities in Russia. Many chose to move to Russia at that point in time. And obviously those um, you know, family connections still exist. Good relationships also still exist uh, despite the political orientation and what actually uh, happens in place. So what I was talking about with regards to migration earlier was an unusual um, situation really that seeing the mass exodus of Russian citizens into Georgia because, um, well, strictly speaking, Georgia is under sanctions from Russia at the moment. So Georgia can't really trade with Russia right now and we, that's the follow on effect of the 2008 war. But 
we didn't restrict the incoming, um, I guess, produce or migration from Russia into Georgia. So it's a very easy country to come to at this point in time. And I can imagine that um, countries where um, people enjoy similar freedoms, you know, Georgia is a sovereign nation, freedom of speech exists there. So that can be an attractive, um, at this point in time, proposition for uh, say Russian citizens who feel that they may be constricted in some way or are potentially, um, well, you know, just looking for an opportunity to uh, wait out the storm, if you like. Um, in terms of the uh, longer term alliances, well, um, in the post-Soviet uh, Union environment, there was a desire to create a, what was called SNG, alliance, and it was an alliance of uh, former Soviet Union nations, it was predominantly a trade union and alliance. Um, many of the countries opted out of it purely because, again, the economic alliance cannot be completely separated from the political pressure, because two are so closely linked together. Um, so that would probably play a role in what types of alliances will remain or will continue forming around Russia. So I think that alignment with the um, political structure will still play a role in whether the alliances will be formed or not. And I can imagine that uh, the countries that uh, have struggled to maintain their sovereignty will probably be very cautious about which alliances they will choose to enter into from the economic benefit perspective. Thank you. Well, well, continuing with that theme, um, Olga, um, of course, the Georgian leader you know about was Joseph Stalin, and he was succeeded in the Soviet Union by somebody born in the Ukraine, Nikita Khrushchev. Um, that just shows us how complicated but integrated that region really was there. And we all know that the Soviet Union won World War II, and it did it through a lot of domestic production and an ability to make stuff that it needed to make to not worry too much about consumer needs, but to do a huge effort in industrial production pickup. Is that, you know, you said one of the problems that Russia today has is that it's too economically integrated. Uh, is there not still a, both a memory of the Soviet resilience, but also an ability in industrial production to go back and make stuff again that can't be imported, i.e. to be resilient against the blockages and sanctions that are likely to be mounting up? That is a very interesting question. I think we're starting to understand the impacts and people are starting to um, fast forward, you know, two years, three years, can we make this in Russia? That's exactly the question on every industrial CEO in Russia at the moment. I think the answer is probably yes, the resilience is there, slightly different circumstances. And you know, the what you can make under a huge patriotic drive is probably not there when you're not defending your country when you are the aggressor. Um, uh, so I, I'm not talking about you know, sabotage or anything like that, but I think, you know, if you look at Germany in a war situation and a lot of in the industries within Germany, there was sabotage there. So I think, you know, there, there might be an element of reluctance to participate in something like this, but obviously, you know, self um, preservation um, prevails as well in those sorts of scenarios where you have to live and you have to make something to, to drive to work and things like that. Um, I feel like the, um, the prognosis is probably because of that hyper-integration, uh, we are in a very different scenario. A lot of commentators um, are mentioning that Russia, or, you know, we're back to 1990s or we're back to 1950s. We're actually in a very, very different environment because there has been that era where people have seen what's possible and going back to some of that, um, uh, you know, yellow colored paper, for example, we've had that for years. You know, we, I grew up in a situation where, you know, toilet paper was great. <laughs> you know, those sorts of things, very, very practical. We just did not make anything better than that. Um, so, you know, we, there's memories of this and you can make a version of it. But I think the at the moment, 
it's it's kind of not geopolitical and it's not economic it's actually psychological probably which is very similar to what happens to Russian soldiers at the end of um, Second World War, those that have seen on the way they've been told stories about how, you know, Soviet Union was superior and how we lived and they knew how people lived and we had a few famines and going um, a few uh, a few years and um, before the um, Second World War. And when they traveled to Western Europe and went through there, and even though it was all destroyed, they saw the difference that you know, living standards and how um, they could live a different life. And those people, when they went back to Russia, they were sent to concentration camps because they were too much of a threat psychologically to the others to say, well, there has to be a better way and there has to be a different system. And I think the danger now, and there's already commentators saying this, that people with any memory of abundance and how advanced products could be used will need to leave the country or they will be sanctioned and retaliated upon um, by the system because the system will want to wipe any knowledge and memory of that to be able to survive and to be able to kind of self-preserve. So yes, people may be driving a, um, a Russian-made truck, um, but it will be psychologically very, very difficult to do that. And I think a couple of recent examples I was able to see um, or, or get, get evidence of. So even Russian trucks, uh, the percentage of componentry that is actually made in the West, I think our biggest truck is 30% Daimler um, components. So that integration will be nearly impossible to, um, to, to substitute in any sort of reasonable amount of time. Uh, there are some sort of bypasses. So if you talk about Volkswagen, for example, there are assembly plants in China and some of the componentry has been substituted so China can make some of that. So there may be a flow um, into Russia, but I think the main conversation at the moment is about um, cannibalization, sadly. Um, so when you have a hundred airplanes and 10 of them get disassembled to make the other one, the other 90 fly, um, those are the realities. I think the capabilities are too, um, incapable of being at the level where you need to be. Um, so you can make some products that will serve the function, but they will not satisfy the people because they know it can be better. Um, and then some things are really outright dangerous. So for example, pharmaceuticals, that's a real, real concern. Well, Olga, um, there was of course that Soviet black joke about the man who worked in the factory for, for many years it was a factory that made components for sewing machines. They asked him what he wanted for his retirement. And he said, I'd like a sewing machine. And they said, you've worked here for 40 years. Surely you've picked up enough pieces to put your own sewing machine together. And he said, well, yes, I have. But it keeps coming out as a machine gun. Now, one of the things, of course, that no doubt the Soviets suffered was an inflated view of life in the West. We had grey toilet paper as well for a very long time when we had import licensing and only one producer in New Zealand, Caxton Works. We had, we had it also not as bad, but we recall some of those sort of things. Right at the moment, um, we've got NATO chiefs all meeting. Uh, we've got pressure being applied by the Americans to keep the sanctions together. Uh, perhaps a bit unusually, Britain, Switzerland and Singapore which are these financial hubs where we know there's a lot of Russian money and Russian property have also come in behind in this and hung together on it. But it doesn't necessarily look like all of East Asia is behind it. Grant, you have had quite a lot of involvement around East Asian central banks and other bank financial matters. Um, when you looked at the uh, voting in the UN for sanctions, East Asia was by no means all in favour of it, and some of them actually voted against it. Uh, but do you think this is going to really change the economic picture around East Asia? We're looking now at TPP, which China has applied to join, where we've got RCEP, which China is clearly the, by far the biggest player in. Um, we're all wondering about dependence on China from an economic point of view. Uh, Australia has suffered its own informal sanctions as a result of that, although interestingly, some people are saying China might quietly start buying Australian barley again, 
and some of the other Australian products. And indeed, I think Australia's terms of trade might go up as a result of what's happening in Russia, not down. But do you think we're really going to see around the ASEAN, Southeast Asia sort of picture a confused view, a neutral view, an anti-Russian, pro-Ukrainian view, a get-in-behind-China view? What, what changes is that going to mean for us? And this was another of the questions that we put through in the chat. Grant. Well, my experience uh, with the ASEAN countries is that there have been increasing, uh, <clears throat> albeit sometimes reluctant, dependence on China, uh, China being the driving force in the region, and it being a driving force that is increasingly making um, sitting on the fence a difficult option. Um, now, you know, so in other words, you, 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 you're likely to have to get off the fence on one side or the other. And from the ASEAN point of view, most members, it's pretty clear that um, they, they need um, that relationship with China, both from a, sort of a geopolitical point of view and from an economic point of view. So, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I definitely see... Um, the sort of you know deglobalization, the regionalization as an important macro trend that's going to continue. And so e even though the, the, the big blocks are still going to be trading in great volume, uh, the, the the probably the um, the ASEAN is going to be increasingly aligned um, with China. And I don't think they'll be particularly concerned about uh, what's happening in the north of China or what trade might be going on or, or arrangements uh, with Russia. I think they see, think that that is out of, out of their territory. One, one other aspect of that is the increasing um, internationalization of the Yuan, uh, which you know China has been <coughs> promoting for a number of years, but not having a lot of success. I think they, they, they'll be using this opportunity to <clears throat> progress that by trying to shift the commodity, global commodity complex away from a dollar denominated uh, structure to you know, having a greater use of uh, yuan as a reserve currency and, and used for transaction purposes in commodity markets. And certainly that now, you know, China's paying Russia in yuan and Saudi has also agreed to um, accept yuan and payments for oil shipments to China. So, <clears throat> you know, I think you, uh, China is, is, can use this to further its, um, its sort of regional block uh, aspirations. So Grant, just another very quick question just come through in chat. What does it actually mean when Putin says if any unfriendly countries want to buy oil or gas, they'll have to do it in rubles? Well, it, I think this was a strategy. Basically, the, the ruble has collapsed. And so there's really there's no one buying rubles except for the Central Bank of Russia and using the reserves that they have left that are not frozen <clears throat> to buy rubles and prop up the ruble. So it was sort of a, 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 an interesting strategy of this. So, okay, we'll get uh, European purchases of energy to uh, buy rubles. And so we'll just require that um, <clears throat> gas sales be paid for in rubles. So the, the trouble, existing contracts are all denominated mainly in euros uh, the, you know, for the energy going into Europe. But um, so, but the, the more recently, the um, uh, the Germans and Italians, etc., said, "Well, we're not interested in renegotiating our, our contracts. We're not going to be paying in rubles. Um, we're going to continue to pay in euros." So that's a whether Russia continues to demand that, I, I doubt, because either they can accept euros and then the central bank of Russia uses them to buy rubles. Well, they get the, the the Western Europeans to buy rubles. It's sort of a device to help to prop up the ruble. 
but I don't think they'll die in the ditch over it. Mm, okay. Well, thank you. And we've really come to the end of our time. So I'd like to say thanks very much to all the panel members. Boy, we've had some really interesting angles and some really interesting thoughts. And we don't know the answers on a lot of this. And so much of it is going to depend on how long this conflict goes on for and whether or not there's a negotiated settlement, a military outcome, or a pullback. And we know that, uh, that, that sanctions, these sanctions could have significant effects, but they also could be negotiated away in a negotiated settlement as well. Those things are possible. Uh, we're interested in, of course, in what that means for Ukraine, what it's going to mean for ongoing Russian economic relations, and as we've pointed to, the big issue in this region is really also going to be what are the side effects on China, the Belt and Road, which runs through that region. And of course, the New Zealand government will be saying, thank God we did APEC last year and we're not doing it this year because organisations like APEC are going to have a hell of a job working out can they even all sit around the table with Russian delegates at the moment anyway. There's a huge number of questions in all of this. I've learned a lot through this time. I hope you have as well. We would like very much to thank Alex Richter, Charlotte Deans, Carla Davidson, and the Professional Programs Office of Victoria University School of Business and Government. So with that, we'll leave you all, and we will be very interested to hear and learn as this goes forward, and let's hope we get a resolution in the Ukraine. Thanks very much, everybody.